Hi, I'm Graham Smith. Tonight Crash chats to one of the greats of the game. He only played four tests before his career was cut short by South Africa's exclusion from world cricket in the 70s. With limited opportunity at international level, he dominated first-class cricket, amassing 80 centuries and over 28,000 runs. He is Barry Richards and he is a cricket legend. Welcome, Barry. Great to see you. <laughs> it's been a long time, Crash. It's been a long time and uh, always good to see you too. You've, uh, you've had an amazing life, really, because you're regarded by no lesser judge than Sir Donald Bradman as one of the greatest batsmen of all time. Yet in some ways, you're the invisible man. And, yeah. and that's harsh, isn't it? But it's true in a way, isn't it? Because South Africa's test caps only start after apartheid in the early 1990s. And because you played in a whites era, an all-white era, your achievements have been basically erased in South Africa, haven't they? Yeah, pretty much so. And, I mean, Jacques Cullis has got number 27 and, you know, we, we, we started playing Test cricket in 1912. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a bit of a disappointment. And, and you're right, the Invisible Man, and I suppose with Viv having the same surname, <laughs> it didn't help much either. <laughs> Richard kept the name up there, but it was the wrong one. <laughs> no, it, it, it was, I mean, I, I guess a disappointment. But you look at it in an overall context and, and you've had a, a blessed life, really, uh, Crash, because, I mean, you've been involved in a game that you love, you were good at a game you love, and then I went on to actually have a, a career in cricket afterwards. So, I mean, you, you can look at the one side and say, yep, it, it was really disappointing. Look at the other side and say, well, it was pretty good, really. You Flies only it. played four tests, all in the one series against Australia. You averaged 72, you scored a century in your last test innings, and then you were gone forever. When you were walking off uh, in that last innings, did you have any sense that the storm cloud that was going to engulf South Africa, did you think this could be it for me? Uh, I, you know, you always think that there, there's a solution around the corner, that, that you know, they get together. Cricket's too big a part of, of you know, the, the, the world cricket family and South Africa are very much the, the you know, were part of the, the initial uh, England, Australia, South Africa to get it off the ground and those many years ago. So you always felt that there, there was a, a, a sense that maybe there would be a period of time where you'd be out, but you'd still be able to play test cricket again. But as the years rolled by, you know, and there was no... We had a, a government that, that weren't too, were intransient. They weren't going to do anything about it. And then you start to realise this is not going to happen. You've, you've said before that it made you bitter at times, playing county cricket. I remember reading the Barry Richards story. And yeah, so I've read a, your that book. was a bit bitter one. Well, no. I was going to say, and as soon as I said it to you, you said exactly what you said then. You said, oh, don't judge me on that. I, I, I was so bitter and angry. Yeah. I was down in the dumps. I was hating county cricket. Yeah. But you, you just, you, you really went through an emotional trough, didn't you? Just bitter and, and struggle to come to grips with it? Yeah, you do. Because, I mean, I, I think it was compounded and not, not because of any of their fault. But I, I was with Andy and, and Gordon, uh, Andy Robertson, Gordon Greenwich at the time. So every so often they would go off and play the West in these big crowded lords and Trent Bridge or wherever they played. And, you know, then you come back and you, you, you're sort of looking and saying, well, Gordon Greenwich, 100 test matches... You know, I, I would have backed myself to be in that sort of league. And there you are playing in Derbyshire at, at, in one degree with three people there. And, you know, it, it sort of became frustrating, proving yourself at the same level all the time and not being able to take that step up. So, yeah, you know, it was written at a time when, when I, I was frustrated with county cricket, frustrated that we were out the system and frustrated, you know, in general. So it comes across bitter. I think that's where you need common sense and somebody to advise you and a mentor, and that didn't happen. Mike Proctor once said that he didn't realise that there was something rotten in South Africa until he went to England and saw a white man sweeping the streets. He said, no, no, that's a black man's job, you know. Mm. Was it hard as a young guy growing up in South Africa to be conditioned to apartheid? Like, did, did, did you just accept? Like, were youngsters just told the black man was inferior? Like, was it...? Yeah, I mean, I think, generally speaking, when, you, when you're kids, you don't, you don't worry about it. I mean, you, you, but as you get older, you get sort of conditioned to that. And we had no television either. So, we, you know, the, you didn't... Television came very late to South Africa. They, they had the technology to do it, but the government kept it out for, for a number of years. So in a growing up period, you do be... You're conditioned. You're conditioned to your lifestyle. It's, it's as you say, I mean, the first time that I travelled was uh, when I late as a schoolboy in 1963. 
and that was an eye opener for me. You know, be, you know, this, this, this is, is this how the rest of the world is? And and you know, that's when you start to to think about it. And in 1971, you actually did launch your own apartheid protest mm. with one of the most dramatic things South African cricket's ever seen. Oh, you faced one terrible. ball yeah. and then walked off. Tell yeah. us about that. Well, I mean, we we. We'd been out the system for a while, and we we thought as cricketers we ought to make a statement about this. And uh, we had a discussion and a meeting the night before, and we we were actually going to call the game off. That's what that was our thing. We're not going to play. And we saw Charles Fortune, who was a, an old broadcaster from way back. And we bounced the idea of Charles, and he said, "Oh, Barry, and well, Procky was an initiator, and and so was Peter Pollock." Do you think it's a great idea? A lot of people, fans of yours, have come along. Do you think it's fair on them? He said, why don't you make a protest by facing a ball, walking off for 20 minutes and then going back and having your statement prepared? And that's exactly what we did. And oh, Effective okay. uh, or dangerous? Both. Uh, I think it was the start of people saying, you know, this, this, you know, we ought to be doing something. We ought to be doing something, but dangerous in that, you know, we were due to go to the, the, the minister's house for a big barbecue that night. That was canned. And, you know, we got, we got into, um, you know, a little bit of trouble, I guess, at the time. It was, it was a, a real forerunner right in the 70s. And this is 10 years before, you know, it was abolished. So it, it was quite a statement. I guess it must be hard at times when, say, an old teammate like Neil Adcock dies or Peter van der Merwe, and the current players do not wear black armbands because, as I said, that era didn't exist. Now, I can only imagine your sensitivities when that happened. I mean, that must be, you know, a little bit upsetting. Yeah, it was. I mean, Neil Adcock was the first guy to get 100 wickets in Test cricket for South Africa at the time. So, I mean, I, I, I think he deserved it. And Peter van der Merwe actually captained the side and did pretty well. So, uh, you know, it, I, I think... There comes a time when you say to yourself, well, let's put it all aside. I um, mean, there has been politics, it has been bad, but this is cricket, and you honour the guys who are good. And, you know, that was my, my take on it. And I, I, was, I was pretty disappointed that, that the side or the management of the side decided that they, they should not wear armbands. And, you know, you get the sort of armbands for, you know, somebody's sister died or something like that, but this was an actual cricketer. Uh, and it's no disrespect to anybody. I, mean, I don't mind them wearing the black armbands, but I think they should for, for ex-cricketers. Barry, you produced one of the greatest innings ever seen in Australia, but it was in Sheffield Shield cricket. For South Australia, you scored 325 runs in a day against Dennis Lilly and Graham McKenzie at the Wacker. Now, I'll say that again for the fans, 325 runs by one batsman in a day at, at, the, per, at the Wacker, no less. Tell me your memory of it. Uh, well, we sort of got there, and <clears throat> Ian Chappell was his first year as captain of South Australia, and he, he said to me, you've got to watch out in, in Perth. Um, you know, the bounce is a little bit different. The wacker was a, a lot quicker then, and, and you leave leave on, uh, on, the, on the bounce of the ball. But he said the other decent thing about it, it's very consistent. So if, if it bounces there and you watch it, you know it's going to come through at a pretty consistent height. And I went out, and the first ball, <clears throat> I actually played and missed. To Graham McKenzie, opened the bowling and he played and missed. And, and uh, John Inverity was at slip and, and Marshy was keeping. And he, he, he turned to Invers and he said, you told me this bloke could play. And, of course, at the end of the day, you know, it was only a five-and-a-half-hour day. We only had an hour and a half before lunch. Uh, you know, I, I smacked Lily over his head and Invers turned to Marshy and he said, yes, he can play. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was quite a funny little incident because, you know, I could hear... I mean, Marshy was in a very loud voice. <laughs> but, Barry, isn't it funny how the world's changed? I mean, that uh, year against South Australia, you were on a dollar a run, weren't you? Like, you think of the IPL riches now. So, wow, what did you do with your $3.25? But incredible, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it was, as you say, very different. I mean, uh, IPL has just changed completely the, the, the outlook of players. I mean, you could only play and make your name in Test cricket in those days. Uh, one day cricket came in 69 when I was part of it. The John Player League started in, in, the, in the UK. So that was the sort of start of one day cricket. But now they've got, you know, you can be an independent contractor now. You can decide who you want to play for. But in those days, it was very different. So you had, you break Don Bradman's record for most runs in a Shield season 
And you made, how much was it? Yeah, $1,538. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, you could buy a bit for that. You couldn't buy a house, but you could yeah. buy a bit for that at, yeah. uh, in those days. And I, I used to live at a place called West Beach, which is now part where they've got the footy oval. But it was like in the outback in those days, and I had a chocolate brown valiant that I used to drive around in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of fun, though. We, you know, we had, uh, I worked for Coke, and uh, Greg Chappell worked for Coke. That was his year that he made his debut in Test Cricket. And, uh, and Kerry O'Brien, remember the athlete who yeah. went to the Olympics? He, he, the three of us used to, uh, to work, work <laughs> for Coke. <laughs> Some people felt that you had you know, one of the greatest techniques the game's seen. Where did it come from? Uh, practice. <laughs> no, I had a, I had a, a couple of good coaches. I, I had a, a friend of, of my dad's who, who saw me when I was young, and then uh, of course we, you know, as you go through school, I, 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 I sort of look at that, and I think they get very pedantic about the, the you know, the MCC coaching book was very much the Bible of cricket then, mm. and uh, I, um, uh, you know, that everything was to the letter of the law. I think if I'd do it again, if I was coaching again, I'd be, a, a, you know, when I started coaching, let the players go. I mean, Darren Lehman came into our Sheffield Shield side as, as a 17 or 18 year old. Uh, and you wouldn't call it a perfect technique, but a, an R like a dead fish. So let him be. Whereas when I started playing, everything was, you know, the perpendicular, the foot to the ball, you know, eyes in line, all this sort of stuff. So you, you, you pay attention to that. And if you're diligent and you practice, that's, that's how you became. But I wouldn't do it again. I grew up hearing stories that the great Barry Richards used to, when he got tired of batting like that and a bit bored, you'd turn the bat on the side and challenge yourself by just batting with an edge. Now, is that true or not? A uh, bit of an urban myth. I did it twice, uh, both times for a bet. Uh, the edges were about this thick in the middle. <laughs> these are these are massive. They're, this is a modern bat, and this is uh, the, so the edges are about there. So it was a, a sort of reasonable challenge. It was once in county cricket and once in a club game, so that I could. Uh, the person challenged me and said, "Listen, if you can do it," and uh, I stayed in for the whole over. I'll buy you dinner, and that's what happened. Did you stay in? <laughs> oh yeah, no, I I, I hit five and and left one, <laughs> very elegantly. <laughs> There's always been a big debate in South Africa. You had two absolute world champion batsmen in the one team, Barry Richards, Graham Pollock. Who was the best of them? All right, I'll put you on the spot. Who was the better batsman, Richards or Pollock? Uh, which Richards? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I always said that, you know, Graham was one, was the, the, the best left. Well, I, I saw Sobers play, but not, not a huge amount. I mean, I saw Graham Pollock play, a, a, you know, an enormous amount. And I such respect for him. I, I think he's probably the greatest placer of a cricket ball that I've ever seen. You know, you, as a captain, when I used to captain against him, I mean, he used to put the fielders where, for, for me because wherever I put them, he hit the ball in a different place. And, uh, I mean, he, he was a, just an absolute... I mean, if you, you speak to chaps like Carl Rackerman, who wasn't a bad bowler, and Rodney Hogg, who was <laughs> pretty sharp, they, they, those sort of guys played Graham when he was over 40 and he, he smashed him around the park. And, uh, I mean, you can imagine what he'd be like at... Instead of being 40, he was 25. I mean, he, he was an enormously good player. I think Viv was the best right-hander in my era and, and Graham was the best uh, left-hander. But to separate them is very, very tough. And uh, I, I don't think they should... They, they keep comparing eras and I think that's, that's wrong. Barry, yeah. you had one truly tragic event in your life and that was the, the death of uh, your eldest son, Mark, who committed suicide. Um, it must have been just... A, just a, well, I know it for a fact, it just rocked your life, didn't it? Yeah, I mean, it, all the disappointments that you've ever had in your life before are just put into into perspective with all of that. I mean, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. It's, it's just the worst feeling in the world for, for any parent to have to cope with that. And, um, you know, it's just it's it's just so sad. It's, it's almost hard to talk about it because yeah. it is so sad. Yeah. Um, uh, and you, you just wonder, you know, there's, there's a lot of youth depression, suicide I in Australia. Uh, and it, it's something that, that's got to be brought out of the closet. I mean, a lot of cricketers suffer from depression. The, the suicide rate amongst cricketers, ex-cricketers, professional cricketers, particularly in England, is double the normal. Mm. So, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a problem. And we've got to... We've got to I'm, I'm not an expert on it, mm. but there's a problem. And we need to, to create the awareness of that so that people who can solve the problem do. And I know a lot of your mates are actually quite worried uh, for you uh, in the few years after it, because they just felt a fire went out in you that, that just never was reinvigorated, that, that you were really struggling for, for year after year. Is that true? 
Yeah, it is. And I mean, I had a marriage breakup as well, which, you know, that, that's, it's, it's a double whammy. So, yeah, I mean, uh, in the end, Crash, I, I, I've, I've met a lady who's really good and, 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 I, and I think that, that sort of helped uh, a lot. But, you know, there's, I, you look around and see the tragedy in the world and, and how people cope with it. It's not an easy thing to do. And, uh, you know, I've, I've had mates who have also lost kids. John Bishop is one that, that we talked about earlier, but um, you know it's just it's 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 enormously sad. I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. Barry, you only played four tests, but you did play Kerry Packer's World Series, and you averaged eighty and were one of the stars of the show. Can you remember the first time Packer contacted you? Uh, well, it, it was actually a, a chap called Austin Robinson. I happened to be in Perth at the time. And I was the first overseas player that, that signed up. And, of course, being South African, out of, the, out of world cricket, it was, uh, you know, it was like a godsend. But he, 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 he swore us to secrecy, and I, I kept it a secret for, for six months. I, I only told a few people, and, and one of them was a journo who you and I both know called John Bishop. And I, I told Bish, on, and I said, I'll give you the scoop you know, this wouldn't happen today, but I'll give you the scoop. When I give you the signal to give it the tick, you can write it, and I'll make sure that you're the first person. And he, he kept it under wraps for six months, and, wow. and so did... Well, I mean, I, mean, you, I was in Perth, so I'd, bu I'd bumped into Lily and Marsh and, you know, nod, nod, wink, wink, but nothing nothing came out. Really? When no you were talking about it then, there was no, no hint at all? No. Nothing? Well, pa Packer said, I'll sack you on the spot, <laughs> and he was a pretty impressive and big bloke. And so. what about the first time you got to meet him? Yeah, I mean, there, there were. I, I'd been sort of warned a little bit by because I'd been in Perth. So the Aussie guys said, you know, you know, just pay attention, p's and q's, and watch them all. But the, the best thing was when we signed up. You know, Gordon Greenwich played for Hampshire, and he he wanted to <laughs> sign up. So during a, a county game, we we had sat in a in a little place away, and they said, hey, there's a phone call, and Mr. Packer on the phone for you. You see, but we used to phone each other, Procky and Rossi, and we used to phone and and pretend we were somebody else, you know, some make up a name. So I thought this was a, a setup. He says, ah, yeah, who's it? And I used a few choice words. <laughs> and I suddenly realised it was Kerry. And he said, how's, how's, what's this Greenwich like? So I said, ah, oh, he's OK. Yeah. He said, I want to sign him up. He'd bring him up. Be at the door just at seven. I said, well, Kerry will be playing. And we're in Southampton. It's two hours. So he said, well, get him up here as soon as possible. And I took Greenwich up up to the penthouse, signed him up straight away. <laughs> really? And was it true John Snow was in that mm. meeting as well? Yeah, he was. <laughs> and I won't tell you what, <laughs> Snowy's hair came up like this because Kerry said to him, you're pretty old, but I'll give you a contract, <laughs> in words like that. And, and Snowy, of course, was quite an aggressive sort of guy. And he, he looked at him and he said, what? <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. Isn't it funny? Because that would have really rolled him, wouldn't oh, it, John no. Snow? He, yeah, he, yeah. Was, uh, he would have been very grumpy about it. Because all the boys reckon Packer loves Snow just because he was a real yeah. old firebrand, yeah. you know? He was. I mean, I, I, I think there's a lot of stories and myths about Kerry, but he, he was a very ethical man, in my opinion, because, I mean, if, if he shook your hands and there was no one else uh, and made a, a deal with you, he would keep it to the letter. You weren't an Australian citizen, then all of a sudden you were, and everyone said, that's <laughs> Kerry Packer's influence. Is that correct? Uh, it's sort of... Ha I, I managed to get permanent residency. Well, it was a funny story. I got 200 in Perth, and they were struggling with, with opening batsmen, so uh, I, I come off in the pads, and it was like 40 degrees or whatever, and, and John Cornell, remember, Strop came in and he said, listen, the big man wants to see you in, in half an hour. Oh, OK, so I go up there, and there was... Uh, Ian Chappell, Richie and Tony Gregg were all up in the room and they said, he said, you're playing for Australia next year because you're living here. So, I carry you, you know, you pay the bills. So, OK, well, I don't think it's a good idea to switch teams. Uh, you know, we're trying to create, an, uh, you know, the fact that it's, it's Dinkum and, and you're switching teams. And uh, <clears throat> Tony Gregg said, no way, you know, he's one of us. And Ian Chappell, to his credit, said, listen, Kerry, he's not Australian. We don't really think he should. He said, no, no, I made up my mind. And uh, this is what will happen. And, uh, you know, you will get your permanent res residency, all that. And then eventually he got talked out of it because Tony said, listen, I've got a young guy in South Africa who's a really good player. He played at Sussex. And I think, you know, he hasn't played any representative cricket as such over there and he'll come over here. And, 
we'll get him over here and he'll open the battery. Kepler vessels. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. But you got your citizenship anyway, yeah, thanks to Packer. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> he, he was good to the word. What about wickets, Barry? Like, yeah, uh, no, uh, <laughs> I could see your head go up. But, like, in World Series, they had good wickets and others where you must have been facing these blokes on, on average wickets, fearing for your life almost. Yeah, I know. That, well, that's why helmets came in. It's exa- yeah. the only reason that helmets came in. We had Dennis Amos, who, you know, was... and probably myself, we're getting towards the end of our career, wife and kids and all this. So, you know, they, they, and, they, Any wicket that stands out where you look back and you think... Yeah, oh. there was one. <clears throat> what had happened is, you know, there was a first jo- drop-ins with John Maley and um, he he was making them and they sort of... It was all experimental. They were in two halves, and so you'd have a crack, crack down the middle, you know, and that was about the West Indies length. <laughs> but anyway... They, he, he, for the initial period, he cut them a bit low, and so that you know there was the bounce wasn't there. So you know everybody, all the bowlers were moaning. So Kerry said, "Okay, the next one, leave the grass on it, but make sure the Australians are not playing." <laughs> <laughs> so you copped it as the World Eleven, yeah? World Eleven versus the West Indies. We were bowled out for 101, and we reckon we were dead set going to win the game. Really, and and we uh, we bowled them out for sixty three. We, we didn't even turn the lights on. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> oh, I'll never forget. Majid Khan opened with me, and and Andy Roberts straight in the mush, bang straight in it. So down he went, and I uh, caught him off. Poor old Maj. and then uh, Zahir came in at three. <laughs> oh. <laughs> With two white men batting. I yeah. mean, his eyes are like. <laughs> That's not bad. <laughs> and, and there, there was, you know, well, there was a pool of blood there. I mean, yeah. uh, so it was, it was not a great wicket. <laughs> Speaking of helmets, what did you make of them? As in, you you batted pre-helmet and post-helmet. Mm. Did they change the art of batting at all? Oh yeah, I think uh, you know, guys, probably guys who, who shouldn't have been hooking did. I, that it's one of my regrets in many ways, Crash, because I think it takes something out of the game. It, it's a fear. For, it's like driving a Formula One in a simulator. You know, yes. there, there's fear, but there's not. That sort of fear, you know, that you, you might be carted off one of these days. So I think it, it took the... A lot of guys get hit now because I, I think they, they don't fear for anything. Mm-hmm. Whereas in, in the past, you, you really had to pay attention. If, you know, if, if Dennis Lilly was trying to hit you on the head, you had to make sure you get out of the way. We looked at the big bats before. It's funny, you're a batsman, but you've become a bit of an advocate for bowlers' rights. Mm. You said you don't mind... You, you'd you like to see a fairer contest. You wouldn't mind seeing bowlers rub the ball in the dirt. Natural element. I, I think, you know, they, they talk about ball tampering, but if you give me that bat crash, I mean, that, that, that to me is almost like bat tampering. I mean, there's, they, they should have a limit because, I mean, if you go like this and you top edge it now, I mean, it, the keeper used to run back and catch it. Now it's row S20. He catches it because mm-hmm. it just flies off that. So I think that the balance between bat and ball has got out of out of whack a little bit. And reverse swing comes when you you do that. When if you, if you're allowed to use the natural, I'm, I'm not saying bottle tops and sandpaper and bot, you know screwdrivers or whatever or long nails. I'm saying the natural element that you play on. If you put it in the dirt, and you know Darren Goff was a perfect example. He could bowl a beautiful reverse. But you give it to Andy Caddick, and no disrespect, you're a good bowler, and, but, but he couldn't bowl reverse. So there is a certain art to it. Hmm. And I, I, I think bowlers should be able to use a lot. And you were one of the few cricketers that really got to know Don Bradman reasonably well because he so admired you and you played in South Australia. Did you deal with him much? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I went to his home for dinner and I obviously got to know him reasonably. I mean, very... I, I would have called him the ultimate professional in an amateur era, for, you know, because he was very methodical and very, you know, everything was well planned. I reckon you're a pretty hard marker on rival bowlers. Like, it took a lot for you to, to say that you really rated someone. So who did you rate? Uh, I mean, it depends. Obviously, Underwood on a wet wicket, Bishan Beatty for the flight, Dennis Lilly for the pace, Tomo for out-and-out pace, Michael Holding. Was I mean, Tomo the quickest? Tomo, I think, was the quickest, yeah. I mean, he didn't know why. <laughs> and he didn't know if he hit you on the head. He wasn't sure why he hit you on the head, but he was lightning. He was very quick. Just summing up your relationship with Gordon Greenwich, who was regarded as a very complex guy. You know, his nickname was Blue, wasn't it? As yeah. in Moody Blue. Yeah. Difficult guy. What was he like and why was he so complex? I, I mean, uh, it's, it's hard to put a finger on it. I, th- I think one of, the, one of Gordon's... You know, he came to England as a, as a, a teenager. Well, it might have even been 13 or 14. And he learnt all his cricket. He was a more orthodox player than you would associate with the West Indian side. So 
and I think when he started to make it in, into first class cricket, he wasn't sure where he was, if you know what I mean. Would he be accepted by the West Indies? Would he, you know, would England not be happy that they taught him how to play cricket, but now he's playing for the West Indies? So I, I don't know whether that affected the way that he was. But, um, you know, he, he, he was a little bit complex, but what a player. I was a sort of a bit of a, the artistry type player, you know, the, and used the pace of the ball. He was, he was just muscle and, you know, and he just whack it. With South Africa making the decision to not name grandstands after their famous players of your era... All after maps, east, west. <laughs> yes, that, that, that's right. But, but you had one chastening moment, Barry, didn't you, when a photo of yourself and Donald Bradman suddenly disappeared. Tell us about that. Yeah, it was sad. I mean, I, I thought it was... I mean, Bradman, for us, is, a, is an icon, you know, all around the world. He's not just in Australia, but, you know, every cricket-playing country knows who Sir Donald Bradman is. I mean, he's got to be the best cricketer that ever lived. No-one's twice as good as the next guy in his era. I mean, Sachin's not twice as good as Lyra, who's not twice as good as Callis. But Bradman in his era was twice as good, and no-one's ever done that. So, you know, he's an absolute icon around the world. And I had a photo taken which he signed and I signed, I thought it'd be nice to put it up in Kingsmead, but... I. I, um, I found it in a rather in disrepair, so I had to go and get it all done up again and I gave it to my school. Which was, I, it was it true that it was under the bar? They'd taken yeah. it down and it was under no, the bar? I, I think it had just fallen down and uh, no one had bothered to pick it up. Uh, so, you know, that, those sort of things are a little bit disappointing, but, mm. you know, that's, that, uh, there's, a, I suppose, a reason. Well, one thing that won't be disappointing is your 70th birthday party <laughs> uh, this year. I understand people are coming from near and far... Uh, What's your bucket list? What do you want for your 70th birthday? <laughs> I want to be 69 again. <laughs> uh, no, three score and ten, so you, you've got there. I mean, I, my actual bucket list is, is being fulfilled, uh, Crash, because my partner Ingrid uh, and I are going to the Masters. It's her 60th, my 70th, so we thought we'd do the Masters in absolute style. Uh, Chubby Chandler, who's a, he, he's the manager for Lee Westwood and a few of the guys, he gets houses uh, around Augusta. And we're going as part of all of that. It's it's costing a big dollar, but we're going to do it in style. And we're going to New York, Gusta, and that's it. 70th, done. Magnificent, Barry. You've been a wonderful guest. I've loved you telling your story. Thanks for being so candid. You're a true legend of cricket. Well played. Thanks, Crash. Great. Thank you very much.